Would you like to discover how to land $80,000 per month SEO clients? If so, make sure you keep watching. Today, I'm interviewing Dennis Yu, and he runs several seven-figure agencies. He's also on a mission to create over a million jobs. And in this interview, we're going to discuss how to land $80,000 per month clients without any sales outreach, plus content marketing for agencies and how to scale your SEO team. So with that, let's jump straight in. Hey, Dennis, how's it going? Pleasure, Julian. Good to hang out. Thanks for coming on. So you currently work on generating leads for agencies. Is that correct? I want to see agencies grow because the more agencies are able to hire VAs and other people in their hometown and whatnot, the more we're hitting our million jobs goal. That's awesome. So your your goal overall is, I saw this on your Twitter as well, is to gain a million jobs or, or create a million jobs in total. Yeah, right? I think... Yeah. Us as digital marketing agencies, whether we do SEO or Facebook ads or whatnot, given the world has changed in the last couple of years, we have kind of a almost a, an impetus to create jobs for everyone else to create opportunity. And nothing, there's been no stronger opportunity I've seen in the last year or two than what's happened with agencies. So what a fantastic opportunity for us, even though there's a lot of other bad things happening in the world. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, it's a great opportunity. And I mean, the amount of people working remotely over the last couple of years has just skyrocketed, hasn't it? It's just grown exponentially, yeah. which is exciting. <laughs> yeah. I joked cool. with my buddy, John Jonas. Have you heard of onlinejobs.ph? Yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah. So you guys, if you don't know, it's the world's largest marketplace for virtual assistants. And he has 2 million of them. And I've known him for many years. So I flew in to see him a few weeks ago. And we recorded all this training on how to hire VAs to process content and do all kinds of stuff that's process driven. And the joke was, he said, so you're the world's highest paid VA. I'm like, yep, I am. <laughs> we're all VAs. If we're in an agency and it's virtual, you're a VA, right? So Julian, in some way or another. Guy. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to have to change my job title on LinkedIn now. <laughs> You've created an extra job for me. <laughs> so in terms of scaling acquisition for agencies, where do you start? Like how, I assume like you, you come in and you focus on like increasing sales in some way or improving marketing systems. You want to talk more about how agencies get clients or how to execute for the clients? Yeah. How, how agencies get clients and, and what things you recommend? I have a very unique view, Julian, because I've never done any cold calling, cold emailing. I've never said, let's hop on the phone for 15 minutes and talk about your thing because every, it's going to sound ridiculous. Every single client we've ever gotten has been them coming to us. Mm. So getting a Nike or Starbucks or Red Bull or a real estate agent or whatever has every opportunity speaking or, you know, our joint friend, Nick Williams, like he reached out to me, all these agencies that we coach, they've all come to us. So the here, it's really this simple. You take care of your clients. They will talk about you. You don't have to work very hard to get them to talk about you. It's so, literally like that. Then you can interview if you want. You can interview them on a podcast so that more people will see that. You can use dollar a day targeting so you can target everyone in your niche. So like with Nick, you know, it's childcare or our, our friends with Tom Ferry, it's real estate agents or Glenn Vo, it's dentists. So it's easy to get industry exposure to people who are real estate or home services or whatnot. It's super easy to do because you just share what you've done. And then if you take it to the next level, you, you guys have seen like in seven figure agency, you publish a book. So this, this is the number one book on Facebook advertising. It's been the number one selling book on Facebook advertising since the beginning. And when you look at the number one selling book on Google AdWords, it's by the same guy, Perry Marshall. And he's my partner. And we have a TikTok book. We've got the number one Google ads book. We've got the number one Facebook ads book and Hopefully we'll have the number one TikTok ads book. So just literally publishing, sharing. So those of you guys that are in seven figure agency, like you, you see, we're literally sharing how we do everything. Mm. That's the best way to get growth. And then you're never going to have to spend money on ads to drive sales. You don't have to have appointment setters and cold calling, and you can still do your whole strategy onboarding and that kind of thing. But I've never had this issue and I've been doing this almost 30 years. Yeah. That's it. If you share your best tips and you, Give that's people, simple. If you help people, then it's always going to bring in clients, right? And it flips the script as well because yeah. 
I, I mean, for me, I have tried outreach in the past and it's a totally different dynamic when clients come to you and they see you already as the expert, maybe they've, you know, they've read the book behind me or they've watched yep. my YouTube videos, yep. might have seen my posts on LinkedIn, all of a sudden they already see me as the expert and it's just a case of, you know, figuring out the details. Yeah. yeah. I was at an Infusionsoft conference. They used to have, it was called Icon. I guess they're bringing it back with, you know, COVID and all that. And I spoke on stage in front of a bunch of people and somebody came up to me afterwards and he said, hey, go ahead and pitch me. Go ahead and try to sell me so that, you know, you convince me that you should hire, that I should hire you for digital marketing. I said, hey, I'm not here to convince anything, right? And he said, yeah, well, you're a really bad salesperson. You're a really bad business owner because you should always be ready at any point to sell me this pen or whatever it might be. <laughs> Wolf of Wall Street style. Yeah, exactly. Or how much, you know, always be closing Alec Baldwin kind of stuff that you're doing. And look, there's a bunch of people that sell that. There's a bunch of other agency groups that teach like you've got to be closing and you've got to have more salespeople and get more appointments and they show their calendar and it's full of appointment, appointment, like 15 minute appointment, appointment, appointment all the way down. And to your point, Julian, I just don't see that that's just not like being treated like a salesperson. Maybe I just don't like to be rejected, but I'd rather them come to us saying, man, I hope there's a way that you can fit us into your schedule. Maybe we can afford you or maybe like whatever we can do, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. I've got the budget. I'm, I'm going to be a good client. And then I'll say, okay, well, if you meet this criteria, then it's like the difference between, you know, going to a pawn shop and they're trying to sell you something versus you want to apply to a prestigious university where you're like, mm. you're applying and you're trying to get in. It's like, oh yeah, I got into Harvard, right? Well, they're selling stuff. Or the, the analogy is like the emergency room. I, like all of us as digital marketers, we are in demand because businesses, they need help. So when people come into the emergency room, Julian, do we have to convince someone who just got in a car accident that they need to have surgery? I hope not. No, yeah. <laughs> so they're bleeding, they're dying, they have clear pain, not to say we want people to get in car accidents, but if they come into the emergency room, we're going to diagnose what's going on. We're going to say, Julian, we did an x-ray. It looks like you have a broken bone. It looks like we need to do this kind of surgery. It looks like we need to give you this kind of medication. And the trust is there. There's no, it's not like you walk into the emergency room and I'm the emergency room surgeon and I'm busy because there's a lot of, you know, gurneys going back and forth. It's busy because it's the emergency room. And then Julian, you say, Dennis, I want to talk to every single surgeon you have in the hospital and have them explain to me exactly what kind of surgery they do and how they do it and all. What would you say, right? Someone comes to the hospital. Yeah, it's not going to happen like that. that. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess it's a difference between, you know, outbound, you're qualifying yourself to the prospect, right? So you're trying to convince them, whereas inbound leads, they've already qualified you. They already see you as the expert. They're ready to buy. And it's just a case of just having a conversation, isn't it, normally? Yeah. You're an SEO expert. So if you do a search on my name or, you know, emergency room surgeons don't knock on doors or do a search on that, you're going to see an article that I wrote many years ago on why, if you're a pro, you don't need to go knock on doors. Like imagine I said, Julian, Hey, you need heart surgery today. In fact, I'll give you half off if you buy in the next 60 minutes. What would you say to that? I'd be a bit worried. <laughs> why is it half off? Okay, fine. I'll, I'll, you know? I'll throw a free <laughs> kidney transplant too. On yeah, top of that, uh, right now. Yeah, at that point, like the value goes down, right? The, the yeah. positioning. Yeah. Let's yeah. say, for example, maybe you have a son and the son is ill. Are you going to go for the cheapest doctor? What do you think about this no, doctor I... that's sitting around not doing anything? Or the doctor that's going around knocking on doors, door to door? They're not busy at all. They're just trying to get <laughs> patients, right? You got to wonder what's going on, right? Yeah. Yeah. Why is that? Definitely. Yeah. If you're good, if you're good at SEO, you don't have to do cold outreach because people will come to you and you can charge whatever price you want. So, you know, Bruce Clay, right? Yeah. Bruce Clay and Mike Mann, they invented the term search engine optimization 28 years ago. I was with Bruce. We were at Microsoft's headquarters and it was for the Bing launch party. So we were underneath the space needle and Bing paid a couple million dollars to turn the thing green. And they, the food was incredible, right? Hmm. And Bruce came up to me and he said, Dennis, you know, what's going on with your agency? Why aren't you charging more? 
And I said, well, I think it's ridiculous to charge more than this amount for this kind of project because it only costs us this much to do it. And he said, no, 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 what you need to do, this is the thing I have, and this is, this is like 12, 15 years ago. When did Bing launch? I was there when, it, when they launched, when Microsoft launched the thing. But he said, what you need to do, so if you're in SEO or if you're in digital marketing, you need to understand this because Bruce Clay is the first one to, to get $10 million a year under a single agency for SEO, mm. right? So he knows what he's doing. At least he knows how to sell, whether he knows how to do SEO or not, which he does, but he knows how to sell. He said, you need to stand in the middle of the road and declare, I am the best. And half the people will look at you and say, that guy, he's crazy. Who does he think he is? And the other half will say, he must be the best. And then exactly. they'll pay them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah now, if you don't have the expertise, then you're a surgeon who, you know, claims that you can do heart surgery and then you're going to kill all your patients and eventually your word of mouth and reputation will kill you. But if you know how to actually do SEO and you know how to do local, you know how to do whatever it is, then you can charge whatever price you want. And you don't have to do it because when you do the cold calling and all that, even if you are competent, it puts you psychologically in a different position, Right. So that's why inbound marketing is just way more powerful. And that's how Bruce was able to use his SEO tools, conference speaking, you know, charge a hundred grand just to go do a speech, charge 50 grand just to meet, just to have a meeting, right? I remember he was, we were at PubCon and we were going to have dinner, but he says, no, I got to go to the airport because I have to catch a flight to Sao Paulo for this client that's paying some uh, just exorbitant amount of money just to meet him for one day, right? And that's what he told, he told me, Dennis, you, you know, the reason, because I said, well, you know, I have this problem, this problem. And he said, no, you actually want to decrease the number of clients that you get. You, if, cause some people say you, you would think like Julian, like a better, a higher close rate's good, right? Like, oh, some people say I close 80% of my leads, right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot That's of people bad. talk about that. Yeah. That's bad. You should maybe close 30, 40% because there's a bunch of clients that you shouldn't take on because they're a nightmare, because they don't meet your criteria, because, you know, it's just not going to be worth it. It's going to be a headache. So the trick is being more selective about the clients you work with. Yeah. If yeah. you're working at the enterprise level, right? If you're working mm. at, at national level companies like chains, whatnot, if you're doing a bunch of the same thing where you're, you're doing a lot of home service, a lot of HVAC, a lot of real estate, a lot of personal injury attorney, then you can sell a cookie cutter package, right? which is great, right? You can do like 300 chiropractors at $1,000 a month. That's great. Yeah, yeah. But if you're doing something that is that is not a local level, like VA execute, and there's nothing wrong with that. I love VAs and I love, you know, I love seeing the factory at work. But if you're doing something at the national level, like we were doing Quiznos and we were making $80,000 a month, which is great, right? From one client. One client. Like, yeah, there's, there's a, it, there'll be people listening to that and thinking, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> well, they, they had 5,500 locations. Hmm. And so their COO came to me saying, hey, do you think possibly, you know, maybe you could take us on? And you know, I was thinking, Quiznos? I don't know. I mean, they're a sandwich shop and they're smaller than Subway, right? Do you have like Quiznos where you are? They're a sandwich chain in the US. I don't know, but yeah, I guess it's like Subway. Then maybe. Yeah, it's a big sandwich. Like Subway's got 25,000 locations and they have, five, you know, these other guys, Quiznos is 5,000 locations. And he's Bill, who was the COO, came to me because we had a mutual friend. He said, I've only got $85,000 a month. Do you think you might be able to take us on? And I thought, oh, well, yeah, I think I could probably make it work, right? And we had a mutual friend who was the chief marketing officer of Dish Network. And Dish Network is one of the top five spenders in the world on PPC. So, you know, we know something about that. And we have a lot of the same friends. So... That, that's what happens at the enterprise level. So we can charge whatever price we want. Like the first time I got Microsoft as a client and we were doing Facebook ads and analytics for Microsoft Office, I think I, this is when I was really dumb. This, this was like 2007 or 2008. Mm. I think I charged them like $10,000 for the initial project. And I thought, this is like maybe 15 hours, maybe 20 hours of work. So that works out to like $500 an hour. You might think that's pretty good, right? Microsoft wants to work with you. They'll pay you 10 grand. It's 20 hours of work. Would you take it? Honestly, I mean, if it was me doing the work, I wouldn't take it. But if it was my team doing the work, I, yeah, we would take it on. Yeah. But then what happens if you, have you worked with a, a client like a Microsoft or a Viacom or like a, 
you know, Fortune 500 kind of company? Uh, only through our white label agencies that we work with. So we do the work, but the agency will take the, you know, marketing agencies will give us the work and then they'll take yeah. a margin in between. Yeah. So we work with, with some really big clients for doing that. Yeah. Got it. But if you're the agency that's, that has the direct relationship with that client, then the amount of legal and contracts and, you know, getting paid 90 days later and just all this back and forth. Yeah. Like when I thought Microsoft was great initially, and, but then we had the initial meeting and then they brought in all these other people who weren't there on the first meeting. And I think we ended up having 10 or 15 meetings and each meeting had 15 people in them. And before we officially started the project, I already burned through $20,000. Wow. In legal fees and creating PowerPoints and all that kind of stuff. So at the enterprise level, there's a ton more money if you're the one with the relationship, you're the agency with that relationship, which is totally different than talking to a business owner where you just got on a Zoom call or whatever, and then they just go ahead and sign up for your package and you just repeat the same thing over and over again, and then you don't need to be involved, right? It's very productized. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not that one's better than the other, you just need to know that those models are different. Yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah, enterprise is so different in that respect, right? I guess, I've, I've honestly, I've never worked with an enterprise client directly, only doing white label, like I say, but I can imagine, yeah, much more demanding, much more red tape, a lot more compliance, and like you say, a, a lot more personalization in the actual service. A lot of meetings and a lot of consulting. So the one yeah. thing, I never hear people talk about this, but if you're working at the local level and the clients are paying, say, less than 2000 a month, I don't believe you can build in consulting, right? Consulting mm -hmm. is, oh, I have this idea. What do you think about this? We should run a TikTok campaign or I saw a competitor do this kind of thing. I wonder if we could do this sort of guerrilla campaign or whatever. Like when you're offering a package, you can't offer anything like that. But when it's a Microsoft and they want to meet, then you sure as heck better be there. Yeah, that's true. I mean, did you find yourself like you have to catch a flight, that sort of thing, yeah. or just travel quickly? I yeah, mean, the, the, dentist, the dentist of 20 years ago was naive and said, oh, I'm going to do all this internet marketing stuff and I'll just live on the beach and have a laptop and it'll be great because all they need is an internet connection, right? Four hour work week, all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, Tim right? Ferriss style. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then how many times have I been to Portland to have a meeting at Nike? I mean, it's great going to Nike's campus. There's the Bo Jackson gym. There's this huge field. You know, there, there's all kinds of cool stuff. They have the cafeteria, which is nice. Or hanging out with MGM in Las Vegas, where when we meet with them, they comp us hotels and shows. And like, we go visit Jack Daniels, which, which is part of Brown Foreman in Louisville, Kentucky. They have all these new drinks and they have a tour and they like all these really cool things, like visiting these different clients, visiting the NFL in Santa Monica or their main headquarters in New York. It's just super awesome, right? CNN and Atlanta, like these places are awesome and having these guys as clients, but man, the reason they pay a premium is because they want to see you. And technically you could do a Zoom, but they want to see you. So I've got almost 6 million miles. I've had to fly around a lot to meet these folks. Just out of curiosity, when you say they want to see you, is that like they want to see you personally or, or you, your team can handle it? Or it's literally like you have to be there, the top, you know, the CEO or whoever has to be in there in person. So there's two things. One is the relationship side. So when we got the Golden State Warriors, which is a basketball team, I had to be there because the person who brought us in was the new CMO. So when he came in, Kenny Lauer, he said, yep, you're the first one I called. I got this job. I want to bring your team in because C-level people are very loyal to who they work with. And they always bring in their people and kick out the other people. So when a C-level person or maybe even the head of digital is there, then you as the agency owner, the other figurehead have to also be there. But when it comes to the execution, tactically, the day-to-day you know, -day meetings, project management, building campaigns, the reports, that kind of stuff can handle, that. that's tactical people on their side and tactical people on your side. So uh, I, I, see, like, yeah. I learned this a long time ago, I wish I knew this earlier, was when you come in and you do an engagement with an enterprise client, so anyone who's paying more than 10 grand a month is probably an enterprise client. Then you say, hey, to set expectations, this is our onboarding process. And this is how we do this one, two, three, four, five. So we preempt any side, any sort of question they have along the way. And we say, we need, we're going to meet more often in the first 30 days, 90 days, because we need to get things up to speed and, and that kind of thing. And so when the big boss is there, you'll say, 
we will have these strategy meetings every month. And so in the strategy meeting, we're going to cover high level things and the big learnings, but then the tactical teams are going to meet every week. And here's what happens at the tactical level. But if there's a strategic issue, you can send a note. We can have a quick call if necessary, but we like to save the, the, the bigger picture things to every month. Otherwise, if you don't do that, if you don't separate out the, the tactical day-to-day -day execution with the strategy pieces, then everyone tries to attend every meeting and then you will get killed. And then the executive mm. will quickly tire of attending meetings. They'll say, this is ridiculous. This is not worth my time. Yeah, that makes sense. Executive, yeah, yeah. Because they want to know what's going on, especially because it's a new relationship then the tactical teams have to produce the reports, have to be able to operate so that the people who are not in that meeting, this, this happened with Microsoft, with Jack Daniels, with like all these big brands, the people who are in charge, the VPs of marketing, the CMOs, they want to know what's going on here. So as long as the, the meetings are working and then they're sending out the notes and there's a, a project management system, we like Basecamp, then that way they can see what's going on. So they have a question, they can ask it. And then we will accumulate that and then have a monthly strategy meeting. And then I will come flying and, you know, maybe every 90 days or every year or something like that. So I show my face in the beginning because of the relationship and the close the deal. Yeah. And I'll show myself every few months, right? Sometimes it'll be like we did a deal with Fox, right? So David Wertheimer, who's the president of Fox, would have me actually want to come in. I remember one time, we were talking about American Idol and some of these different shows and movies that they, you know, Fox is a huge entertainment company. And we had this, this question of like, how often should we be posting on social media? And what is the ROI of doing lots of tweets and lots of Facebook posts and running, you know, Facebook ads on TV ratings, which then allow them to sell more money for sponsorships because that's what TV media sorts of companies do. And we weren't really sure. Well, they weren't sure what to do. And my opinion was you guys are posting way too much because they hired Gary Vaynerchuk of VaynerMedia to do a lot uh, of so, stuff. So they were like, I mean, he recommends posting a, a yeah, silly amount of times every day, right? Ridiculously, because yeah. that's what his interns do. And VaynerMedia is very good at it. And Gary mm, Vaynerchuk yeah. is like, he embodies the whole like too much information kind of thing. So I was explaining to the president of Fox, you know, I think we should focus on the posts that do the best. So we don't just overload people and then put money against those posts because that's you're going to get a higher multiple on the posts that are already working well organically that we then boost, which is something that we've done for many, many years. And I was explaining this. It was just me and, and the client. And then all of a sudden, Gary Vaynerchuk walks in. I said, Gary, what are you doing here? He's like, Dennis, what are you doing here? And David said, hey, guys, let me, let me explain. I needed to bring you two together in the same room so we could just... Because I hear each each you guys are saying something different. I just need mm -hmm. to you know, get you two together and go and, and just hash this thing out. And Gary did 90% of the talking, maybe even more. Like I couldn't even get a word in. <laughs> but then Gary just imagine, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you just, you just cannot get a word in. I know Gary says he's a good listener and all that kind of stuff, and he does listen, but he he you can't you cannot have a conversation with Gary, right? He just starts, he just talks over you, and then it's just like, okay, fine, right? But after Gary left, David said, what do you think? Right. And I said, well, what do you think? Right. And David's like, well, you're, you're focusing on the analytics and not just on more engagement and more fans and all that. So I think, you know, you have the right strategy there. And I said, yeah, that's right. Cause I'm focusing on your goal and the tactics are driven by the strategy, right? Not just, I want more impressions. I want more likes. I want more, whatever. And then Gary said there, just like he said on stage, He'll say like, because I like to measure things. Mm, and then he'll say, yeah. well, what's the ROI of your mother, right? That's the comeback he's had on me several times. <laughs> I've never heard that one before. Yeah, yeah, it's a good one. But then yeah. I'll say, yeah, okay, there's long to do. You know, what's the ROI of a brand? And what's the ROI of building relationships? Like I get that. But there's a lot of stuff that we can measure along the way, even though it takes a lot of time. And so, so that kind of stuff is not something you would sell in a package. That requires consulting. There's a lot of trust that comes from when you're well-known where they expect you to be there, right? I could just forward an article or forward them access to one of our 95 courses where they could go through all that kind of stuff. But when it's a big brand, they'll pay whatever it is that you want because they would just rather hear it directly from you and their time's super valuable. And that vice president, they'll pay 50 grand, they'll pay hundred grand to have you there.
right? Because then it's safe mm -hmm. for them. Oh, well, Dennis, you was here. Dennis said this, right? Yeah, I suppose that's a safe option. It's more about, and as well, they have the budget, right? Like, like you were saying, if you're working with enterprise, they can spend that big money. Whereas if it's a small, medium business, it's only going to be, it's only going to go so far, isn't it? They just don't well, have they need the to, spending the small power. business. Yeah, the small business needs to see direct sales. Mm. They don't yes. care for consulting. They don't, it's not like there's a marketing department with this big budget, right? The small business, every dollar they put in, they need to see that money come back right away. So two completely different approaches. Yeah, it's like branding versus direct response, I guess, right? Generally, yeah. 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 Which makes the SEO tougher because SEO is a blend of both of them, right? There is a much longer term component in SEO. Definitely. Yeah, that's it. That's, I think that's one of the things when you're working with a new client, you have to set expectations in terms of yeah. SEO doesn't work overnight. But I will say a lot of clients that come directly to us, especially inbound leads, they expect that they know it's a long term game. Yeah. 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 Just out of curiosity, like I know you said you were working 20 years ago in enterprise SEO. How did you yeah. first get started on all of this? I built the analytics at Yahoo, which is a search engine, which was a search engine over 20 years ago. Oh. And my job was to police all of these SEOs that were trying to trick us. Oh, shame on them. <laughs> People that think they know yeah. SEO. You know, yeah, I'm speaking yeah. at a conference at PubCon or one of these, you know, cert that we had SMX and SES and all these search engine kind of conferences. And the guys who went there, you know, they're my age, they're in their 40s and 50s. And we would, we would talk to these folks that were trying to trick us. And I felt that I had kind of a unique position because this was before there was a Matt Cutts or these other sorts of figureheads. Now Danny Sullivan is, you know, working at Google. And I, I figured the best way, if you want to be a, a thief, if you will, and you want to work at the, at the safe company, right? Because then you're going to be in the best position to learn how to break the safes if you worked at the company that made the safes. So if you want to be good at SEO, don't you think that there's an advantage being there early at the search engine and knowing how, you know, build, like we're building defenses against people trying to trick us. And I know the SEO people, they're not spammers or what, you know, tricksters or whatever, but they, they, there is an antagonistic relationship, as you know, because the SEOs don't pay Google. They don't pay the search engines, but, but they're trying to get something out of us. So I'd go to these conferences and these SEOs would boast about some kind of trick they have and they think they're so smart. And I'm, I just want to tell them, I've got a team of engineers and that stuff that you're talking about, we can see right through it, right? Mm -hmm. Do you really think we can't see that? Oh, you're doing triangular linking. You have some private link network. You have some AI bot generated content that you filter through a link laundering layer. You think we can't see that? You think that you can cloak because of all the IP addresses you think that we have. You don't know all the IP addresses that we have. Do you think we're gonna publish those? Come on. So that created a very good foundation in understanding how these algorithms work, I guess. And then when you went onto client work, probably helped you a lot, right? I think I have a very different view on SEO because I was at the search engine, right? And I'm, I was looking at it from the other point of view. And the same is true for Facebook ads, right? So, you know, we've spent a lot of money on Facebook ads. And instead of the taking the advertiser point of view, which is, okay, I'm going to load up these campaigns in a certain way and spend a certain amount and you get a certain number of conversions at a certain conversion rate, you know, cost of acquisition, LTV, that kind of thing. That's great. That has to happen. That's the advertiser point of view. But the publisher point of view is whoever has the inventory that's getting paid by the advertiser. So I always understood the publisher point of view. And then the third point of view, which almost nobody on the planet has, is the network point of view. So the network is Google. The network is Facebook. So I've worked closely with Facebook for many years, closely with Google for many years. A lot of the people on my team at Yahoo went to go work at Google, then Google IPO'd, and then you know, they made a lot of money and retired and, that, and I'm still working, but you know, they retired and all that. So I believe that whoever has the network point of view, Julian, and all you guys that are listening out there has, I believe a much smarter, more informed view because the network is how we bring together the supply and demand, right? So the advertisers are paying the money, the publishers are getting paid because they have the inventory and the mm -hmm. network is the market maker like Google's a market maker, Uber is a market maker with drivers yes. and riders, 
So I've always taken the network point of view to try to understand what the needs are for each of these folks and how it works together. So, you know, with Google on the paid side, quality score is one of the biggest factors, right? Yes. And yeah. on for social, Facebook had a relevant score, which they used to show. Now they show the factors and Yahoo has a quality index. But all of these things are, are based on the intersection of content and targeting. So, are, you know, like Google says, are we giving a good experience to the user? So when you look at click-through rate, engagement rate, average CPM, secondary factors that are used and paid, that that's a signal on whether the user is having a good experience. Now, from the SEO side, you have things like rank brain. You have data that comes through Google Analytics. You have the, see, like whether the user is having a good experience or not, right? Yeah, you, core web vitals. Sort of thing. Yeah. Core, yeah, core web vitals. You have things like in search results, the click-back rate. So someone clicks on your thing because you had a really good headline or subject line, but then they click back and then they go to the next result, you're going to get penalized, right? Yeah, pogo, yeah, if they pogo stick onto the site and then jump off yeah. a couple of seconds later, yeah. It's the same thing. It's the same algorithm on paid versus organic because it's looking at whether the user has a good experience. Hmm. That's the thing. I mean, I find that you get so many algorithm updates, but the core philosophy of that network, whether it's Google or Facebook, it doesn't really change. It's all about the user experience, right? I don't even care about the latest updates. Nobody knows what yeah. they are anyway, because they're all rolled out to different combinations of users. So no one really, and the folks at Google and the folks at Facebook will also confirm and say, nobody really knows because there's so many different changes happening at the same time. No one person is coordinating all these changes. So no, no one knows, not even, you know, Bill Slosky, SEO by the Sea or Brett Tabke or whoever, no one knows. Yeah, that's it. Awesome. Um, just something else I wanted to touch on. I saw you, you, one of your posts was about goal setting, right? Yep. And you talked about reviewing it every day, not every year. As an agency, like how, how would you recommend implementing that as an agency owner? Well, there's short and long-term goals, right? And there's a way to bridge them together so you eventually are moving in the right direction. <clears throat> We've got an army of virtual assistants. And with virtual assistants or people that are junior, I know I'm stereotyping a little bit. We like to have a management structure because they need it. It's like swaddling cloths. They need accountability. They, you know, if you're not in an office and it's virtual, you know, it's like, even I'll have this issue. And I've been doing this a long time where it's easy to get distracted because of social media, you know what I'm talking about, right? So you've yeah, got to have this structure. So we like to have what we call an SOD and an EOD process. So start of day and end of day. And the start of day is a check-in. So all the people have to check in. Some people call it a bed check, nine o'clock. It's like a five minute meeting. Like everyone just checks in, make sure you're there. Everyone's doing okay. It's the equivalent of being in the office and, you know, having a coffee and seeing everyone else just otherwise it's like you stay up late then you don't show up or you go yeah, do some yeah. other thing. And then you just, you just need to get people to have the discipline to start, especially if they're young. It holds them accountable, right? Yeah. As well. If you don't have an office, I believe you need to have that. And I learned that the hard way of thinking that people are mature and independent and you give flexibility and then they just end up wasting the whole week because of the dog and they want to go play and their friends are wanting to go to the mall or you know, they end up, I'll do it later tomorrow and then it never happens. And pretty soon they're behind and just like, it's a bad, okay, it's just bad. So you need to have that, that, that steady accountability. And it doesn't mean you have to make it like the police, but you need, you need to have accountability. And just then one, the, sorry, just one question on that, on that topic. Yeah. If, if you've got a remote team and they're all working from different countries, how do you get them to check in at the same time, start of day, or is it just a Slack a update lead. or something like that? You have a team lead. You could do a Slack or a Discord. A lot more technical people like to do it inside Discord or Basecamp, mm -hmm. or you can have Infusionsoft send out this note every day where they have to update it. There's so many different ways of doing it. But the point is there has to be a time-driven record of when people are starting. And if you have teams in the Philippines or India or Scotland or New York or whatever, then you have teams that they, they could either have some kind of flex time if they're senior, or it's it's known that this is these are like these core hours and this is where you have to be. If you don't set time expectations, most people, they could be really good employees, really good workers, but they just don't know how to manage the time. Yeah, that's something I've learned as well. Learn the hard way. It's just making sure All people prioritize the tasks. Yeah. It's so hard. If you allow people to start whenever they want, it's not that they're trying to cheat you. It's not that they're bad people, but they will end up just falling apart and then be 
frustrated and unproductive and feel overwhelmed because now they're not in touch with what's going on. Their projects are stacking up, their inbox is full. It's just a bad situation. Actually, this is one of the good things about getting coaching from Nick is yeah. every week, if I say I'm going to do something, the next week he will make sure I've done it or he'll definitely yeah. ask me about it. You know, that accountability yeah. is so powerful for anyone. Yeah. And we make it fun too. So you, you guys know Grant Cardone. <clears throat> Grant Cardone is arguably the number one social media influencer. So I had him make a number of videos for us. So if people don't turn in their goals, then it sends a text message and it says, hey, Grant Cardone here, Dennis told me that you didn't submit your goals. Shame on you, man. I look at my goals every single day because they're so important. And, you know, I, I write down my goals when I, before I go to bed and I look at them in the morning. So submit your three by three goals. You know, I'm going to be watching you. I want to be you know, hearing back from Dennis saying you didn't submit your goals. Right. So that's what we call a triggered message because it only happens when something has happened or not happened. So we have lots and lots of these message messages that uh, obviously Grant Cardone is not personally sending a message every time someone doesn't submit their goal sheet. But it makes it more fun because if it's just me or it was just a, a text message or something in Infusionsoft or HubSpot saying, you know, hey, Julian, where's your goals? Then it's like, oh, the system is, you know, the bot or whatever is chasing yeah, me. But yeah. if, if you make it a video and he made it as a video, right? And I've got a bunch of these where, where he's walking around, he's driving his car, he's on the exercise bike. It's just way more fun. So I, I find that gamifying it, making it more personal, especially when we have virtual workers is just better. Yeah, that's that's an awesome idea. I'm going to try that. Yeah. 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 Have, the, have the virtual Julian think. Can you think about what are the circumstances that would trigger a reminder or trigger a congratulations or trigger, oh, you've been with us for a year or it's time to submit the report? Or can, can you think about what those most common situations are? Absolutely. I think one of them would be, well, we set KPIs every 90 days for our team. So they're all accountable. They all know they have one or two things they need to achieve. And that would be like the perfect time to send a video message or to get them engaged like that. Yeah. So and it is gamifying a bit. So you or the team leads could actually send out individual messages that were made just for that person or just for that team because they hit a certain goal. Mm -hmm. And there's something to be said about actually making real videos. But I think 80% of them should be pre-made videos that are triggered by certain situations. And what would be great is if you start by doing that, and these literally are just 15 second cell phone videos, not professional in-studio videos, because it needs to feel like Julian is watching, not in a police kind of way, but in like an encouraging coaching, yeah, yeah. congratulations, like, you know, cheerleader sort of way. Because otherwise, if you don't put that in, then the messages they get from you are going to be more like, where's the status report? Or why didn't we, or why is the client unhappy? Or why did this bad thing happen? Why isn't the project done? Where, what's going on with this task, right? And if you've got a lot of virtual assistants, then that can be especially bad because they are sensitive to authority and looking bad and being ashamed and that kind of thing. So try to build in most of those little pieces of feedback being positive encouragement. Like, hey, five status reports in a row, good job. I just, yeah, that's yeah, like once, that's it. But video. You see, you see what I mean? It's like having those notifications and, and triggered messages be, be video as opposed to like a text message. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. It makes a massive difference. It's such a much more of a personal touch, right? And then they feel like, okay, the owner of the business is actually watching, you know, he's interested in what I'm doing and it makes them feel a bit more important as well, right? Which everyone wants to you feel. want to know like. a little secret I have? I shared part of it in Miami at the seven-figure agency thing a couple of weeks ago. Mm. You know, we could automate that, right? We can automate the personalization of that. Is that, you know, Nick was saying, is it Descript? Is that the Descript, program you recommend? See? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. I'm going to hit share screen. Let me, uh, yeah. there we go. Okay. You see my screen? Yes. All right. So I'm just going to do new camera. Okay. And I'll say, I could change it to the, to whichever camera, but I'll just do it like this, okay? And All I'll right. say, hey, Julian, I wanted to see how you're doing on that status report because it's March now. And I noticed that you only had three tasks that were done last week. Anyway, I hope you're doing well and maybe we can catch up and have some fried chicken sometime. Okay, so 
I've made this and it's transcribing it automatically. So let's play it. Hey, Julian, I wanted to see how you're doing on that status report because it's March now. And I noticed that you only had three tasks that were done last week. Okay, anyway, so I hope you're doing well open and maybe here. we can catch up and have some fried chicken sometime. Okay, you see this? Yep. I recorded this off of the laptop. The, the, the audio was off of the laptop because I'm not, I have an NTG5 and I have lots of cameras and mics here, but I did, you know, off of Descript, I did this here. Yeah. And okay, here's, you can see that I can edit the video just by editing the words, which is what Descript does because Descript started as a podcast editing software a while ago. And I'm going to identify the speaker as me, but it can be all these other people. Okay. And maybe now it's April. And maybe it's not Julian, it's Josh. And maybe instead of fried chicken, what's some kind of food you like? Pizza. Pizza, okay. Now you can do this with client status reports and this kind of thing, right? Instead of three tasks, how many tasks? Uh, four. Four, okay. All right. So now the AI is rendering this based on what it knows about my voice. So the better of a sample, the better it's able to render this. Here we go. Hey, Josh, I wanted to see how you're doing on that status report because it's April now. And I noticed that you only had three tasks that were oh, done sure. I forgot to change the last floor. week. Anyway, I hope you're doing well and maybe we can catch up and have, oh shoot, I forgot to press enter on this. What did you say? Ah, pizza? So good. Pizza. Yeah. And I want a second here. Pizza. Okay. And then this is four. I guess I messed up here. Okay. Let's try one more time. It's still rendering. Give it a few seconds. Go on. Yeah. Now, if you do it as a screen share where you're going over the report, oh, you know, it looks like we had, you know, we spent $3,000 and drove 37 calls and had five new, you know, patients or clients or blah, blah, blah. You know, you, it's, you, when you have the little circle in the bottom, they're not going to look at your lips. They can't tell the difference. And also mm, we can change the intonation true. and all this to make it look more, sound more realistic, right? Wow. Yeah. Hey, Josh, I wanted to see how you're doing on that status report because it's April now. And I noticed that you only had four tasks that were done last week. Anyway, I hope you're doing well and maybe we can catch up and have some pizza sometime. It's so easy to personalize. It's awesome. Yeah. I mean, very scalable, isn't it? As yeah. well. Now think about how you yeah. can do that in any part of communication. Now, I don't believe it should replace all communication. I believe it should replace 70 to 80% of the mundane Status reporting, you know, yeah, general yeah. reporting. Hey, attaboy. Oh, you know, congratulations on like, but uh, for employees and for clients, right? And that way, when you do stuff that is real, it's more powerful, right? So we're not That's trying to eliminate well. the personal touch. We're trying to make the personal touch more powerful. So the, the whole reason why the internet exists is so that people can actually connect, even though robots and computers and websites, like we, I built a website for American Airlines 25 plus years ago. And we were afraid that, well, not we, but we had a bunch of flight attendants and people who were in the call centers, they were afraid we were trying to put them out of business because people could go online to the internet instead of having to go to a reservation agent or travel agent to look at how much the price of a ticket was. But actually, by allowing people to self-serve and making those parts easier, then it ironically made it so that the relationship's more powerful. And my mentor at the time was the CEO of the airline. And I was afraid with the internet that less people would want to travel because you could just have phone calls and you see the pictures. So like, why would you travel there? Right? Yeah. So this is the yeah. young dentist thinking like, oh, well, the internet, I can just operate my internet business just from a laptop. I don't need to meet these people. We can just do Zoom. But what do you think happened with the advent of the internet with air travel? Mm. So Even people, more. yeah, people Even wanted more. more connection, right? Yeah, so that's why people still want to meet in person. They still want to have pizza together. They still want to meet. They still want to, you know, online dating's great, but you still need to meet them. And yeah, I think you, you crave connection even more, right? In the digital world, it's uh, exactly. something there's more and more demand for. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. So think if you're an agency or you're a freelancer or contractor or whatever, 
what are different ways that you can use automation to get rid of the mundane stuff that you shouldn't have to do so that you can actually spend time where you have higher leverage in building relationships. So it's mm. not automation because we don't want to talk to people and we, we're like misogynists and hate humans, <laughs> but it's that we, we don't want to waste time on things that computers and automation should do. So the stuff I showed you, I don't think it's disingenuous. I don't think it's like cheating or Machiavellian because we already use autoresponders. We already are using the algorithm to do our targeting and dynamic ad copy and all that stuff, right? It's just making personalization more scalable, isn't it? Exactly. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. As yeah. long as you're not trying to trick people. Yeah, that's it. That's it. As long as it's authentic. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what, what do you think about Have you seen stuff like that? What I just showed you? Isn't that neat? I've never seen that before, honestly. Yeah, that was awesome. I mean, there's so much you could do with that. Not just managing the team, not just sending messages to people, but also with content marketing as well. It's, yeah. it's just a, a lot of opportunities there. So yeah, excited yeah, to check that out, actually. Yeah, onboarding, where you know you, you collect people's goals or based on what their role is, you say something specific to what they are, because everyone's different, you know, based on a Colby personality test or the Enneagram or their personal objectives or where they live, or you can personalize all those things instead of making everyone go through exactly the same thing every single time. Like who wants that? Personalization in every aspect of your business is so key. Yeah, and that's absolutely, what yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, if you're good SEO, it's ultimately about personalization, isn't it? Which increases your relevance score, quality. Yeah, practice. relevance. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, awesome. Well, just uh, conscious of your time. So yeah, thanks very much for, for coming on the show. I've learned a lot <laughs> a lot of things to check out and do so that's awesome um if people wanted to get in touch with you how would they do that or if they wanted to check out more of your your content google you okay that's, the that's how i knew the yahoo thing was over when people when people on my team were saying just google it i said you know what company you work at <laughs> yahoo me instead <laughs> doesn't sound right though but, you know. nah, it doesn't quite ring the same but um uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, well, it's good that we've got SEOs listening because they'll be happy to Google. So yeah. 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 Awesome. All right. Well, thanks very much. Awesome, Julian. And I'd love to hear what your feedback is, guys, right? I'm just sharing the latest stuff that I know, but I don't know everything. I'm always learning from all you guys. So, yeah, that's it. You know, yeah. Reach out. Make your little yeah. one minute video. Share this inside the, you know, the seven figure agency groups, right? Yeah, it will actually. Yeah, I will post this on the seven figure agency group. So awesome. Thanks very much. Awesome, Julian. Take care. Thank you. Cheers.